Oh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, so as my head already said, I'm talking about a simulator um, for graft lift training on the head, so on the parietal bone here on the side. Um, this would be a sort of a technical uh, talk right now. And before I start with my introduction, I would like to warn you, since this is a medical topic, there will be uh, some pictures of uh, surgical interventions. So be prepared. Um, so for my introduction, I'm talking about autologous grafts. Autologous grafts, uh, which are taken from uh, and implanted into the uh, same individual. They are a common material for uh, reconstructive surgery. These grafts, uh, which are harvest harvested from the cranium, uh, the bony part of, of the skull, they are performed about 2 million uh, times per year. And in cranio-maxillofacial surgery, um, these grafts are used for the reconstruction of the nose, face, maybe after trauma, or they are used to uh, build the alveolar process uh, to further um, uh, implant a pivot tooth. So after you have you lo lost the tooth, you can re-implant a, a pivot tooth. These autologous grafts uh, from the skull are favored in comparison to other uh, donor sites, so normally like the sternum or uh, the hips, um, because um, they, are, yeah, they, uh, they undergo uh, less resorption, they are more biocompatible. The surgery scar uh, is uh, hidden below the hairline, except you're a bowling patient, then no, sorry. And the pain in comparison to the other donor sites uh, is uh, reduced. So one procedure to lift this cranial graft is the so-called split thickness procedure. So as you can see here, here's a, a, um, a human skull um, depicted. You can see that this human skull consists of three layers. So two cortical layers um, called the tabula externa and interna, a sandwiching uh, cancellous bone called the dibloe. And this uh, procedure, uh, the human skull is split, so you only take the outer cortical table as a graft to use it somewhere else. Um, as you can see here, this is the procedure and how it is working in this split thickness procedure. Um, after the scalp is opened and retracted, um, a bone island is milled, so you can mill a contour. Then take a bevel mill and bevel the, the outlines of the graft. You split it in situ with an oscillating saw and uh, lift it up with a chisel. And on the very uh, right picture here, you can see the graft implantation in the alveolar process. So, but despite the advantage, advantages, uh, the risk of penetrating the bone and entering the, the brain with these very fast rotating and oscillating instruments is um, yeah, quite dangerous. It leads to uh, subdural hematoma, paresthesis, intracranial bleeding, dural tear, or even the death of the patient. So, these fast rotating um, and fast oscillating surgical mas machines significantly reduce the haptic feeling um, between the uh, bone layers. But this is the main thing a surgeon relies on during this surgery. Further, uh, due to the high speeds of these machining uh, tools, uh, the breakdown of the bone is really, really fast, and thus uh, fatal errors can happen really fast. So, to minimize the aforementioned risks, Appropriate forces and speeds of the used surgical instruments um, have to be used by the surgeon. Thus, extensive training with these machines would be necessary before uh, performing a surgery on a patient. So, um, extensive training would be necessary. And as you all know, practice makes perfect. But where to practice? The education and training possibilities in medicine and surgery include the hands-on experience directly on the patient, which is quite risky. And this learning by doing approach um, happens only under the supervision of an expert surgeon, intrasurgically. Further, uh, education is very often performed in surgical courses on human or animal specimens. Human specimens are very often fixed and thus provide an alternative haptic feeling. And the same happens when training on animal specimens. Very often they don't even have the same anatomy than a human being. And additionally, uh, these surgical courses are very often overcrowded and you cannot train anyway. So as we already heard before, an alternative training method are simulators. These simulators provide a safe and nearly unrestricted environment for surgical training. You are able to provide a, uh, they are able to provide a realistic anatomy, a realistic haptical feedback. They are comparatively cheap 
compared to human specimens, and they show an enhanced transfer of surgical skills compared to solely watching and assisting your supervising surgeon. So for this study, uh, we developed a model-based simulator, so it's just a physical phantom for the training of these uh, cranial graft lifts. So no, uh, sur no surgeons are able to train the sawing, milling, and drilling procedures for this graft lift procedure. This model should provide uh, the realistic haptics compared to the human skull, and therefore uh, tool insertion force measurements were performed in various materials and were compared to uh, human skull bones. Furthermore, uh, the model should also provide a realistic anatomy, and therefore micro CT measurements of human specimens and our uh, artificial skull uh, were examined, and then a three-step molding process for artificial skull was adjusted. So finally, a uh, developed simulator, as we already heard, should teach what is intended to teach, and therefore a validation study was started. So as I already said, to, to gather realistic machining uh, and bone layer parameters, uh, human, human parietal bones uh, from two female donors were used as reference. This human material was obtained through the anatomical gifts program at the University of Hamburg-Eppendorf in Germany in accordance with the Human Tissue Act. And the study was approved by the Ethics Committee of the State Bavaria, also in Germany. From our human references, only the parietal bones, you can see here uh, named one, two, three, four, was used. Uh, adjacent proportions were omitted, and we just cut these um, bone into uh, four proportions. The, uh, the, sorry, um, um, the parietal bone was cut in smaller pieces and was stored at minus 70 degree, and obviously it was defrosted before all our measurements. On the right side, you can see one of our artificial skull caps. Um, which was developed and molded in a three-strap approach, and um, there we realized uh, comparable, bony, comparable bony layers of the human skull. And again, we only used the parietal bone pieces and cut, cut them and used them as specimens. And following slides, I want to show you our validation results of our best-fitting skull model. So as I said, to validate realistic haptics, we performed a surgical tool insertion measurements with a realistic um, surgical drive, which is already uh, also used in the hospital, equipped with three different tools. So as you can see here, a saw, an engraving mill, and a drill. And these are the tools which are really used in, in a hospital. Furthermore, we, furthermore, we used a load cell to uh, record uh, actual insertion forces, and we used different feed rates and in tool insertion depth. As I said before, we also tried to uh, achieve a realistic uh, anatomy, and therefore uh, we uh, performed micro CT scans of our human specimens on our artificial bones. And as you can see here, we measured the total thickness, which is uh, depicted here in red, the diploid thickness, which is uh, here in um, green, the thickness of the external table here in purple, and the internal table, which is in uh, blue. And these um, thickness parameters were measured by an expert. So here I want to present my results of, all of, of our validation. So in the left plot, you can see the exemplary drill measurement curve. And according to the three bone layers, you can see um, a rise of the forces when the tools were penetrating the cortices because they are more dense. And this maximum um, force uh, when penetrating the, the outer cortical layer was used um, for validation. As you can see here on the right, uh, our boxes of our results, they are reasonably congruent for uh, drilling on the upper plot and milling for, uh, and sawing on the, on the last plot, but we had statistical differences for our milling procedure. They were more than twice as high in the human bone than for our artificial skulls. Here you can see um, micro CT images uh, pre-processed of a uh, human parietal bone here in A on, on the left and uh, artificial skull bone in B on the right. And you can see our uh, results from the thickness measurements. As you can see, the external uh, is quite similar between a human specimen and our artificial specimen. And that's important because especially for this surgical procedure, the external layer, which is lift from the skull, is the most important. So as the results of our development, uh, we um, manufactured a prototype, um, which I want to explain here. So 
our human skulls were uh, molded in as a skull cap, as a full cap. And we also uh, provided a non-slip base with a silicone brain bulge, and our skull cap was just attached to this non-slip uh, non bulge. So the brain bulge serves as a support for the artificial skull cap and delivers a change haptic feedback when the tools may enter the brain and the skull is penetrated. Further, the skull cap was covered with an artificial scalp uh, made of two different silicones, mimicking the, skill, uh, the skin and, and muscles of the scalp. Thus, uh, the surgeon has to enter the scalp by an initial incision with a scalpel and by retraction of the scalp is necessary, which realistically limits the access to the skull, just like in a real surgery. So here I want to oppose uh, single surgery steps compared to the surgery steps of our simulator. And as you can see, all uh, surgery steps can realistically uh, be trained. So once again, we have the, after the incision, we have the milling of the contour, the beveling of the outline, the splitting of the graft in situ, the lift with the chisel afterwards, and here on the very right, you can see the empty donor site. So you can see uh, the underlying cancellous bone. So before the simulator can be used as a teaching modality right now, its validity has to be proved. So we started a validation study um, testing face and content validi validity. The face validity um, tests the comparability between the simulator and the real surgery. It was assessed with a questionnaire with a five-point Likert scale by our Novice test subjects. And the content validity, uh, which assesses the extent to which the the simulator teaches the skills required for this surgical intervention. It was also assessed by a questionnaire with a five-point Likert scale by our expert test subjects. The validation of the construct validity is still under investigation. So in our study, uh, 15 surgeons and medical staff participated. All in all, we could recruit eight uh, experts and seven novices. And after they gave informed consent and the general introduction to the surgery, uh, they were asked to lift a graft in the size of 1.5 by 2 centimeters and split it into three equal proportions in situ. So on the uh, figure below, uh, um, you can see the a validation study and one uh, yeah, search and training on our simulator. So here are the results of our face validity. The face validity was uh, answered by our Novice group. You can see here uh, the points of the five point Likert scale. So, number one was strongly, uh, the surgeons strongly disagreed with our uh, um, simulators, which is uh, depicted here in dark blue, and was ranked to five, very strongly agreed, and this is uh, colored here in turquoise. So, 75% of our Novice surgeons agreed or strongly agreed that our simulator teaches all necessary steps to learn this procedure. More than 50% agreed or strongly agreed that such a simulator would encourage them to train more often, whereas 12.5% uh, didn't answer this question or were neutral to this statement. More than 50% agreed or strongly agreed that the simulator is attractive and easy, easy to use. And also 50% agreed or still uh, more than 50% agreed and strongly agreed that they want to have a simulator on their own or in the clinic for training purposes. And again, 12.5% were neutral or didn't answer this question. Then, as I said before, the content validity, which assesses uh, if it's the simulator teaches what it's intended to, was answered by the expert group. As you can see here, the experts uh, all agreed and strongly agreed to our statements. So they all agreed that you can train in an ergonomic, realistic manner, that this simulator is use useful for practicing the surgical machining, that this simulator is quite easy to use, and they've put strongly recommended to others for training purpose. So in conclusion, um, our actual machining forces of the artificial skulls were comparable to the human parietal bone. Our imaging results showed that we have authentic bone layer sicknesses compared to human bones. A simulator prototype type was designed and tested, and surgeons testing our simulator uh, certified good haptical feedback, a good comparability to the real surgery, and that the simulator teaches what it is intended to teach. So in concluding, we de developed a new training modality um, with realistic bony anatomy of the parallel bone, 
as well for realistic haptics during surgical machining. Finally, I want to thank four of companies for, your, uh, for their support, and I want to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for brilliant presentation. So my question is, do you use the cadaver materials, cadaver materials, for the same skills to be gained, cadaver materials, because it might be, will be much more convenient to use this, to train surgeons by cadavers, and the same surgical manipulation on cadavers. Um, probably, yes, you can train the same on, on cadavers, sure, but this is not possible in many countries due to ethical concerns. In my, uh, as I know, in one of our neighbor countries in Italy, it's not allowed to train on cadavers. And in yeah, a lot of countries, it's not allowed to ethical concerns. And furthermore, it's very, very expensive. So this simulator here, made of polyurethanes uh, mainly, is very, very cheap. So we have seen if you compare the intervention on the real human bone and on the simulator, there is no bleeding. Is this important? Um, no, it's not important because bleeding is not always there during this surgery. It's depending on the patient. And we only got the statement from surgeons that it's not really important for the training. 